and good to see all of you. A welcome to our service today. A special welcome. A special welcome to Pastor Justin Smoot, who not only will lead us in service, but make sure that the microphones are in the proper <laughs> position. It was uh, way up there from last week because, of course, he and most of the world are taller than I am. Anyway, the first announcement is that there is a coffee hour downstairs today. And uh, the other announcement is that with Easter, we are now heading into a new setting of the liturgy for the next period of time to come. So be prepared. And it's, it's a liturgy that is not chant. We've done setting 10 before. Instead of chanting, Lord have mercy, uh, glory, or uh, alleluia, all of the, the liturgical settings are hymn tunes. And they're familiar to us. The alleluia is um, what used to be open now, the gates of beauty. So be prepared, be ready. 203, and we go from there. Okay? Adam has an announcement. And while he's coming up, I just want to say thank you for the warm welcome. And we got to fix the clock over here. It's running five minutes slow, and that's why I wasn't up here when it was time. I figured I had, oh, I got 10 minutes to wander around and talk. But no, no. <laughs> Good morning. I just have a quick announcement. Uh, we have been asked by the Synod to have all of our members complete the Congregational Vitality Survey. Um, this can either be done online or in paper form. Uh, we have the paper copies of the survey on a table in the narthex. Uh, the survey is 40 questions long, multiple choice. Um, it should only take a few minutes to complete, uh, but it is important. Uh, our administrative assistant, Michelle, uh, emailed, uh, or, uh, I emailed a link to the uh, online version of the survey to all members, I believe on Thursday afternoon, um, so you can complete it there also. Um, if you are a member of the council, there is a different survey to complete. Um, if you don't have that, uh, we can get you the link or get you a paper copy of that also. Um, but I, we, we do ask that you, please, that, you, that you please have the survey completed, again, either in paper form or online uh, before this Saturday. Um, if you have any questions, you can see me or any member of council. Thank you. Thank you for those announcements. I invite you now to begin our time of worship with our gathering hymn, Now All the Vault of Heaven Resounds, number 367. Please stand as you are able.
Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who forgives our sin and whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Trusting in God's mercy, let us confess our sin. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Let us join in the Kyrie. of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. O God, your Son makes himself known to all his disciples in the breaking of the bread. Open the eyes of faith that we may see in his redeeming work, that we may see him in his redeeming work. He who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated as we turn to our readings. (coughs) 
This is a reading from Acts first lesson. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Today's reading is the conclusion of Peter's sermon preached following the giving of the Holy Spirit to the apostles on the day of Pentecost. The center of his preaching is the bold declaration that God has made the crucified Jesus both Lord and Christ. Here begins the reading. Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Therefore, let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation, so those who welcomed his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 persons were added. Word of God, word of life, thanks be to God. Let us read today's psalm responsively, Psalm 116, verse 1 through 4 and 12 through 19. I will call on the name of the Lord. I love the Lord who has heard my voice and listen to my supplication. The cords of death entangled me. The anguish of the grave came upon me. I came to grief and sorrow. How shall I repay the Lord for all the good things God has done for me? I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all God's people. O oh Lord, truly I am your servant. I am your servant, the child of your handmaid. You have freed me from my bonds. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all God's people. The second reading is from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 17 through 23. The imagery of exile is used to help the readers of this letter understand that they are strangers in a strange land. Christians no longer belong to this age. Through the death of Christ, we belong to God so that our focus, faith, and hope are no longer on such things as silver or gold. Here begins the reading. If you invoke as Father the one who judges all people impartially, accordingly to their needs, live in reverent fear during the time of your exile. You know that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without defect or blemish. He was destined before the foundation of the world, but was revealed at the end of the ages for your sake. Through him, you have come to trust in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are set on God. Now that you have purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, so that you have genuine mutual love, love one another deeply from the heart. You have been born anew, not of perishable, but of imperishable seed. Through the living and enduring word of God, word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God.
The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. Now on that same day when Jesus had appeared to Mary Magdalene, two disciples were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from rec recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Clopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us, told, they came back, and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who had said that he was alive. Some of those who were with went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them, the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So, they went in to stay, so he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simeon. Then they told him what happened on the road and how he had been known to, made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. And come on up, let's do a children's sermon. How was your week this week? Was it good? Did you do a lot of walking? Yes? Where'd you walk? Down to your friend's house. Oh, you returned her lunchbox. That was very nice of you. Did you see Jesus on the way? No. Why not? You don't remember. Well, did you hear how in our reading today there were disciples walking and they had Jesus walking with them. But did they see Jesus? No. They didn't even know Jesus was talking to them and walking with them and helping them understand everything that was going on. Yeah. But you know when they recognized Jesus? When he blessed and broke the bread at the meal. 
Yeah. And you know what? I have a feeling your friend recognized Jesus in you when you showed up at her door with her lunchbox, returning something to her that she lost. Now, it would be great if there would be communion this Sunday because this is like the perfect time to remember that, that whenever we gather and we break the bread, Jesus is revealed to us. And like whenever we share what we have or whenever we help one another out, Jesus is revealed to us. And you know, maybe you didn't see him because people were seeing Jesus in you. So that's something to remember. Next time you go walking to your friend's house, or walking through the halls of school, or wherever you find yourself walking, or riding, or driving in the world. Can you do that? All right, let's say a prayer. Repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for walking with us. Even when we can't see you, you are near us. Help us show Jesus to everyone we meet celebrating your love. Amen. All right. Thanks. And remember, you're going to be Jesus to somebody next week, too. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. And let the people of God say, Amen. There's an interesting thing that happens when we read Scripture, especially the stuff about the disciples in the New Testament when they're trying to make sense of this whole Easter business and what does it mean that the tomb was empty. And one of those things is whenever we read Scripture, we have about 2,000 years of people having spent their time trying to figure out what this whole Easter thing really means And it's a little bit hard to put ourselves back in that mindset of those early disciples because we live in a different culture. We have different assumptions. And one of them is kind of the the assumption about who God is and what God is doing in the world. One of the things that we are really influenced by is, and this is going to get a little, you know, academic-y, education-y, so bear with me. We'll get to the gospel in a little bit. But is the kind of post-enlightenment understanding of God as a divine watchmaker. Now, did that make any sense to you? (laughs) So as we gained knowledge of our world, as scientists were looking into the mechanisms of life, discovering cells and how they work in the body and in plants and in animals, how we were discovering how you know, animals and humans reproduce and understanding how to care for the sick and heal diseases, we were gaining a deeper knowledge of the processes of life that at one time were just miraculous to us. And so we needed to figure out a way to fit God into all of this. If we could figure out how these things were going on in our world, what role did God have in the life processes that we see around us? And one of the ways to explain it was God is sort of a divine watchmaker. If you've ever opened up a watch, you've seen inside are a lot of very small and delicate gears and wheels and springs that require very careful and precise work to manufacture to a standard that will ensure that they will last. And everything needs to be laid just so, so that the tension of the spring continues to move the mechanism long after the watchmaker closed the watch and set it out and maybe sold it or gave it to someone. And, if, and the best watchmakers would create those watches that would last long after they set them in motion, long after the watchmaker was even in the presence of the watch. And so many people saw God like this as a divine watchmaker that, or clockmaker that made the, our whole world and set all of these systems into place and just kind of let us go. And those good things in the world we attributed to the ways that the clocks were running right and the ways that things were going bad was attributed to the ways that our clocks were, you know, screws were loosening and springs were going unsprung and all of those things that were just kind of going wrong. 
And that kind of makes sense to us and it kind of doesn't because of just kind of how that thought was foundational. But it was also kind of a while ago, a couple hundred years ago, when our thoughts on God have evolved. Our understanding of what Easter means and what God, how God relates to us has changed. But it also speaks a bit to why our letter from first or letter from Peter today is talking about being liberated from old ways of thinking, about having a new way of seeing things, and about living in reverence and awe. Because for the for the people, for the disciples that were hearing this message, for the people that were receiving this good news of the resurrection, they were living in a world in which power was very much at play in their lives and even in their religion. If you look at some of the Greco-Roman myths, there's a lot about power and wars, the gods and the titans, and the gods defeated the titans and claimed lordship over the world, and in the death of the titans, the humans were born and sort of inherited the guilt of the titans' rebellion, and so the gods were always at odds with us. And power was seen to be a thing from the divine realm that could impose control on the world. And so you had, you had the Roman Empire that was very much about power and control, and they used that in their religions because they would go any place and say, all right, we are your lords. You just, you can do what you want to do. You just got to recognize that we are more powerful than you and pay us the taxes and we'll be okay. And so that type of God is always looking down at the people as being under their thumb. That type of God is always looking at the people as being weak And what we have here in the gospel is not a God that is looking down at us, but a God who is walking alongside of us. What we have in the gospel is a story about how God walks with us even on those mundane journeys, even in the midst of our confusion. For those disciples that were on the road, Clopas and the other one, they knew some things. They knew that Jesus was a prophet. They knew that all of this was going on, but they didn't know what to make of this strange news that the women brought, that the tomb was empty. For they knew the processes of life, right? They knew how you live and you can die and that your body usually stays dead. And if it's in the tomb for a while, it can't get up and walk around because those processes have ceased. But now they're faced with this reality that there is new life. There is something different. There is something that we can't explain going on here. So where the heck is God in all of this? And in the midst of their questions, in the midst of their grappling with these events, God meets them on the road and walks with them and helps them understand what has been going on as they talk about it, as they share stories back and forth, as they enter into a discussion about the scriptures. And this is going back to even the Old Testament about all of those prophecies about the Messiah. Because we think of the Messiah and we think of Jesus because we've had 2,000 years to make that equation in our heads. But when the disciples were thinking about the Messiah, they were thinking about David's kingdom. And how David was promised by God that there would always be a descendant of his on the throne. And so they were wondering, where the heck is David's descendant now? Because we still have the Romans in power. We still have Herod on the throne. If Jesus was supposed to be the Messiah, why isn't he sitting on the throne? You see how there's a little bit of a different way that this question of the resurrection hits when we place ourselves in the minds of the first century Christians. What we hear then, as Jesus opens the scriptures to the disciples there, what we hear then as Christians then spend the next 2,000 years struggling with what it means that Jesus has risen, they look back into those scriptures and see that 
the God that sent Jesus into the world is the same God who formed humanity by God's own hand and breathed into humanity God's own breath, which is very different from how the Mesopotamian people, even millennia before then, envisioned the creation because they had the creation of humanity being the slain body of a god being mixed with clay to create these creatures to do the things that the gods just didn't want to do. And then to control the population of humans, they would just kind of throw famines and plagues at them to make sure there weren't too many. That's not the kind of god that comes into our world and loves us. That's not the kind of god that forms us by God's own hand and breathes into us God's own breath. That's not the kind of God that promises David a man who was both faithful and flawed that there would be a house for him forever, that there would be a connection between his family and God forever. That's not the kind of God that would enter into our world as Jesus and die and overturn those laws of life and death that we know. For, to give us this example of how to move forward and bring life into this world that knows only death. Bring equality into a world that knows only power imbalance and power dynamics. To bring a radical love into a world that only knows division and hate. And how do we go about doing that as the church? Well, if I had like a nice five-point answer. I'd have a book deal and a consultant, you know, gig. So I can't give you that answer in a nice little hand, you know, nice little wrapped up present with a bow on top. But what I can do is point to those places where I have seen God draw, my, draw me towards life, draw our world towards life. Point, I can point you to those places where you see people coming together across divisions and across lines. When I was in the Holy Land last year, there was a group, there's a group called the Parent Circle that is made up of Palestinians and Jews and Jewish Israelis that have all lost children in the conflict that has been going on for generations. And they realize that the conflict itself is going to destroy both peoples they realize that the continued fighting is not the way. And they are organizing and sharing their stories and looking for peace. They're sharing their pain of loss in telling a story that does not lead to further division between them, but that they come together on their shared pain and find new life. The same way that we are invited to find a common ground with one another. It's really the same way and for the same reason that David wrote in the 23rd Psalm, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Think about that. You sit down across the table with somebody you consider your enemy and share a meal and break bread. We know that Jesus is revealed in there because we know that in that act we recognize the other person, the person the world is telling us to stand against as human like us, as flawed like us, as just as in need of everything that we are in need of. And understanding that common humanity, those common desires and drives that unite us as human beings, as creations of God, we can move forward in a way that does not seek to enhance that division, but to bridge the gap. That does not seek to further alienate the other, but to come together and welcome them into the community of faith. That is why this struggle for what the heck does Easter mean have is spread throughout all of the countries of the world, all through all the nations and all the peoples. It is the same reason this coming together had took root in the Roman Empire, which was so focused on power dynamics, it did not realize that it had pushed so many people to the edges. 
And that is why women were some of the first converts to Christianity because they saw within this faith women who first proclaimed the gospel to the disciples and they found a place that would recognize them for their humanness and not distance themselves from the community for being women. This is why the Christian church has always taken root in countries because there are people who understand and feel just how how unequal our world is, how broken our world is, and understand, too, the ways that those on the margins can lead the march towards peace by recognizing that we are all in need of a Savior, by recognizing that we are all on this road journeying together, by recognizing that even in the midst of our journey, God appears to us And whenever we break bread with one another, God is revealed to us in that meal. And whenever we have the chance to gather in community like this, something new happens. Resurrection happens. Community is born that was not there before or is restored that was shattered before. And we find ourselves with a glimpse into God's kingdom that brings resurrection in the midst of a world that doesn't know what resurrection is, that doesn't know what new life is. And we find ourselves not leading this charge, but drawn into it by the love of God that first reached into our lives and pulled us from the margins to the center, pulled us from humans that are sinful and broken to those who are invited into working for God's purposes. And we find ourselves with no other option but to live in awe and reverence for the fact that someone would love us so much to die to reunite us with those that we would separate ourselves from. We live in awe and wonder that God would come into our world for our sake, even though we haven't earned a thing, but God would come into our world and love us and draw near to us, not because of how good we are, but because of how loving and good God is, and draw us all, even those who we would stand against, into a community that will bring life not just to ourselves, but to the whole world, and there is nothing more wondrous than watching that life spring up. It is as if Easter happens all over again. And we are witnessing the breaking in of God's kingdom, and we have no choice but to shout, Alleluia, Christ is risen. Amen. I invite you to stand as you are able and join in singing our hymn of the day as found printed in your bulletin. Christ is arisen, verses 1, 5, and 4, 1, 4, and 5. Seven.
Gather together with the whole church, let us confess our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us join in our offertory hymn as the offering is brought forward. Let us pray. Liberating God, you break the bonds of injustice and let the oppressed go free. Receive these offerings in thanksgiving for all your works of merciful power and shape us as people of you justice and freedom. You we magnify and adore through Jesus our Savior. Amen. United in the hope and joy of the resurrection, let us pray for the church, the world, and all in need. Please respond with, your mercy is great. Ever-present God, you make yourself known in the breaking of the bread and in the bonds of community. Reveal yourself to us in the faces of all we meet. Strengthened by your body and blood, let us boldly live out your good news. Hear us, O oh God. Mercy is great. As we know you in the breaking of the bread, we know you in the grains of the field and the flowing waters. Care for the earth you lovingly created. Strengthen those who safeguard threatened land and water. Hear us, O God. Mercy is great. You are the authority to whom we dedicate our lives. Help us keep the needs of those most vulnerable at the forefront of our community. Move us to care for any who are disregarded or oppressed. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. 
Mothering God, you feed and comfort those who hunger. Open the hearts of those who hoard resources and lead them to share your abundance. We pray for anyone hungering for your comforting presence this day. Especially, we pray for Joni Dieselhorse, Joan Bonstead, Tom McDonnell, Thelma Bursick, Esther Osterby, Brett Herring, and Joy Carnitz and her family. Hear us, O God. You pour out your love on those who are oppressed. Support and comfort anyone who is marginalized by gender or sexuality and those whose stories are not believed. From this community to listen faithfully and speak honestly in our ministry together. Hear us, O God. We remember with thanksgiving all your beloved saints as you have raised them to eternal life. Abide with us in your promise of the resurrection. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Rejoicing in the victory of Christ's resurrection, we lift our prayers and praise to you, almighty and eternal God, through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our, our Father, who art, who art in heaven, how would be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Receive now the benediction. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Amen. Our sending hymn this day is Sent Forth by God's Blessing, number 547. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.